Chapter Thirteen of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Thirteen. It was a trial to my feelings, on the next day but one, to see Joe arraying himself in his Sunday clothes to accompany me to Miss Havisham's. However, as he thought his court suit necessary to the occasion, it was not for me to tell him that he looked far better in his working dress, the rather, because I knew he made himself so dreadfully uncomfortable, entirely on my account, and that it was for me he pulled up his shirt-collar so very high behind, that it made the hair on the crown of his head stand up like a tuft of feathers. At breakfast-time my sister declared her intention of going to town with us, and being left at Uncle Pumblechook's, and called for, "'When we had done with our fine ladies,' a way of putting the case, from which Joe appeared inclined to augur the worst. The forge was shut up for the day, and Joe inscribed in chalk upon the door, as it was his custom to do on the very rare occasions when he was not at work, the monosyllable H-O-U-T, accompanied by a sketch of an arrow supposed to be flying in the direction he had taken. We walked to town, my sister leading the way in a very large beaver bonnet, and carrying a basket like the great seal of England in plated straw, a pair of patterns, a spare shawl, and an umbrella, though it was a fine bright day. I am not quite clear whether these articles were carried penitentially or ostentatiously, but I rather think they were displayed as articles of property, much as Cleopatra or any other sovereign lady on the rampage might exhibit her wealth in a pageant or procession. When we came to Pumblechook's, my sister bounced in and left us. As it was almost noon, Joe and I held straight on to Miss Havisham's house. Estella opened the gate as usual, and the moment she appeared, Joe took his hat off and stood weighing it by the brim in both his hands, as if he had some urgent reason in his mind for being particular to half a quarter of an ounce. Estella took no notice of either of us, but led us the way that I knew so well. I followed next to her, and Joe came last. When I looked back at Joe in the long passage, he was still weighing his hat with the greatest care, and was coming after us in long strides on the tips of his toes. Estella told me we were both to go in, so I took Joe by the coat-cuff and conducted him into Miss Havisham's presence. She was seated at her dressing-table, and looked round at us immediately. "'Oh!' said she to Joe. "'You are the husband of the sister of this boy?' I could hardly have imagined dear old Joe looking so unlike himself, or so like some extraordinary bird, standing as he did, speechless, with his tuft of feathers ruffled, and his mouth open, as if he wanted a worm. "'You are the husband,' repeated Miss Havisham, "'of the sister of this boy?' It was very aggravating, but throughout the interview Joe persisted in addressing me instead of Miss Havisham. "'Which I mean to say, Pip,' Joe now observed, in a manner that was at once expressive of forcible argumentation, strict confidence, and great politeness. "'Has I up and married your sister, and I were at the time what you might call, if you were anyways inclined, a single man?' "'Well,' said Miss Havisham, and you have reared the boy with the intention of taking him for your apprentice. Is that so, Mr. Goggery? You know, Pip, replied Joe, as you and me were ever friends, and it were looked forward to betwixt us as being calculated to lead to larks. Not but what, Pip, if you ever had made objections to the business, such as its being open to black and soot, and such like, not but what they would have had been attended to, don't you see? "'Has the boy,' said Miss Havisham, "'ever made any objection? Does he like the trade?' 
"'Which it is well beknown to yourself, Pip,' returned Joe, strengthening his former mixture of argumentation, confidence, and politeness, "'that it were the wish of your own heart.' I saw the idea suddenly break upon him that he would adapt his epitaph to the occasion, before he went on to say, "'And there weren't no objection on your part, and Pip it were the great wish of your heart.' It was quite in vain for me to endeavour to make him sensible that he ought to speak to Miss Havisham. The more I made faces and gestures to him to do it, the more confidential, argumentative, and polite he persisted in being to me. "'Have you brought his indentures with you?' asked Miss Havisham. "'Well, Pip, you know,' replied Joe, as if that were a little unreasonable, "'you yourself see me put em in my hat, and therefore you know as they are here.' With which he took them out and gave them, not to Miss Havisham, but to me. I am afraid I was ashamed of the dear good fellow. I know I was ashamed of him. When I saw that Estella stood at the back of Miss Havisham's chair, and that her eyes laughed mischievously, I took the indentures out of his hand and gave them to Miss Havisham. "'You expected,' said Miss Havisham, as she looked them over, "'no premium with the boy?' "'Joe,' I remonstrated, for he made no reply at all, "'why don't you answer?' "'Pip,' returned Joe, "'cutting me short as if he were hurt. "'Which I mean to say that were not a question requiring an answer "'betwixt yourself and me, "'and which you know the answer to be full well, no. "'You know it to be no, Pip, and wherefore should I say it?' "'Miss Havisham glanced at him as if she understood "'what he really was better than I had thought possible, "'seeing what he was there, "'and took up a little bag from the table beside her. "'Pip has earned a premium here,' she said, "'and here it is. "'There are five-and-twenty guineas in this bag. "'Give it to your master, Pip.' "'As if he were absolutely out of his mind "'with the wonder awakened in him by her strange figure "'and the strange room, "'Joe, even at this pass, persisted in addressing me. "'This is very liberal on your part, Pip,' said Joe and it is as such received and grateful welcome, though never looked for, far nor near, nor nowheres. And now, old chap, said Joe, conveying to me a sensation, first of burning and then of freezing, for I felt as if that familiar expression were applied to Miss Havisham, and now, old chap, may we do our duty, may you and me do our duty, both on us, by one and another, and by them which your liberal present have conveyed to be for the satisfaction of mind of them as never here joe showed that he felt he had fallen into frightful difficulties until he triumphantly rescued himself with the words and from myself far be it these words had had such a round and convincing sound for him that he said them twice good-bye peep said Miss Havisham. Let them out, Estella. Am I to come again, Miss Havisham? I asked. No, Gargery is your master now. Gargery, one word. Thus calling him back as I went out of the door, I heard her say to Joe in a distinct, emphatic voice, The boy has been a good boy here, and that is his reward. Of course, as an honest man you will expect no other and no more. How Joe got out of the room I have never been able to determine, but I know that when he did get out he was steadily proceeding upstairs instead of coming down, and was deaf to all remonstrances until I went after him and laid hold of him. In another minute we were outside the gate, and it was locked, and Estella was gone. When we stood in the daylight alone again, Joe backed up against a wall and said to me, "'Astonishing!' And there he remained so long, saying, "'Astonishing!' at intervals, so often, that I began to think his senses were never coming back. At length he prolonged his remark into, "'Pip, I do assure you, this is astonishing!' 
and so by degrees became conversational and able to walk away. I have reason to think that Joe's intellects were brightened by the encounter they had passed through, and that on our way to Pumblechook's he invented a subtle and deep design. My reason is to be found in what took place in Mr. Pumblechook's parlour, where, on our presenting ourselves, my sister sat in conference with that detested seedsman. "'Well,' cried my sister, addressing us both at once, "'and what's happened to you? I wonder you condescend to come back to such poor society as this. I'm sure I do.' "'Miss Havisham,' said Joe, with a fixed look at me, like an effort of remembrance, "'made it very particular that we should give her, were it compliments or respects, Pip?' "'Compliments,' I said. "'Which that were my own belief,' answered Joe. "'Her compliments to Mrs. J. Gargery.' "'Much good they'll do me.' observed my sister, but rather gratified, too. "'And wishing,' pursued Joe, with another fixed look at me, like another effort of remembrance, "'that the state of Miss Havisham's elf were such as would have allowed, were it, Pip?' "'Of her having the pleasure,' I added. "'Of ladies' company,' said Joe, and drew a long breath. "'Well!' cried my sister, with a mollified glance at Mr. Pumblechook. She might have had the politeness to send that message at first, but it's better late than never. And what did she give young Rantipole here? She give him, said Joe, nothing. Mrs. Joe was going to break out, but Joe went on. What she give, said Joe, she give to his friends and by his friends were her explanation. I mean into the hands of his sister, Mrs. J. Gargery. Them were her words, Mrs. J. Gargery. She mayn't have knowed, added Joe, with an appearance of reflection, whether it were Joe or George. My sister looked at Pumblechook, who smoothed the elbows of his wooden armchair, and nodded at her and at the fire, as if he had known all about it beforehand. "'And how much have you got?' asked my sister, laughing. "'Positively laughing. "'What would present company say to ten pound?' demanded Joe. "'They'd say,' returned my sister curtly, "'pretty well. Not too much, but pretty well.' "'It's more than that, then,' said Joe. That fearful impostor Pumblechook immediately nodded, and said, as he rubbed the arms of his chair, "'It's more than that, Mum.' "'Why, you don't mean to say,' began my sister. "'Yes, I do, Mum,' said Pumblechook. "'But wait a bit. Go on, Joseph, good in you, go on.' "'What would present company say,' proceeded Joe, "'to twenty pound?' "'Handsome would be the word,' returned my sister. "'Well, then,' said Joe, "'it's more than twenty pound.' That abject hypocrite Pumblechook nodded again, and said with a patronizing laugh, "'It's more than that, Mum. Good again. Follow her up, Joseph.' "'Then to make an end of it,' said Joe, delightedly handing the bag to my sister, "'it's five and twenty pound. "'It's five-and-twenty pound, Mum,' echoed that basest of swindlers, Pumblechook, rising to shake hands with her. "'And it's no more than your merits, as I said when my opinion was asked. And I wish you joy of the money.' If the villain had stopped here, his case would have been sufficiently awful, but he blackened his guilt by proceeding to take me into custody— with a right of patronage that left all his formal criminality far behind. "'Now you'll see, Joseph and wife,' said Pumblechook, as he took me by the arm above the elbow, "'I am one of them that always go right through with what they've begun. This boy must be bound out of hand. That's my way. Bound out of hand.' "'Goodness knows, Uncle Pumblechook,' said my sister, grasping the money, 
we're deeply beholden to you. Never mind me, Mum, returned that diabolical corn chandler. A pleasure's a pleasure all the world over. But this boy, you know, we must have him bound. I said I'd see to it, to tell you the truth. The justices were sitting in the town hall near at hand, and we at once went over to have me bound apprentice to Joe in the magisterial presence. I say we went over, but I was pushed over by Pumblechook, exactly as if I had that moment picked a pocket or fired a rick. Indeed, it was the general impression in court that I had been taken red-handed, for as Pumblechook shoved me before him through the crowd, I heard some people say, "'What's he done?' and others, "'He's a young un too, but looks bad, don't he?' One person of mild and benevolent aspect even gave me a tract ornamented with a woodcut of a malevolent young man fitted up with a perfect sausage shop of fetters, and entitled, To Be Read in My Cell. The hall was a queer place, I thought, with higher pews in it than a church, and with people hanging over the pews looking on, and with mighty justices, one with a powdered head, leaning back in chairs with folded arms, or taking snuff, or going to sleep, or writing, or reading the newspapers, and with some shining black portraits on the walls, which my unartistic eye regarded as a composition of hard bake and sticking plaster. Here, in a corner, my indentures were duly signed and attested, and I was bound, Mr. Pumblechook holding me all the while as if we had looked in on our way to the scaffold, to have those little preliminaries disposed of. When we had come out again, and had got rid of the boys who had been put into great spirits by the expectation of seeing me publicly tortured, and who were much disappointed to find that my friends were merely rallying round me, we went back to Pumblechook's, and there my sister became so excited by the twenty-five guineas that nothing would serve her but we must have a dinner out of that windfall at the Blue Boar, and that Pumblechook must go over in his chaise cart and bring the Hubbles and Mr. Wopsle. It was agreed to be done, and a most melancholy day I passed, for it inscrutably appeared to stand to reason, in the minds of the whole company, that I was an excrescence on the entertainment. And to make it worse, they all asked me from time to time, in short, whenever they had nothing else to do, why I didn't enjoy myself. And what could I possibly do then but say I was enjoying myself, when I wasn't? However, they were grown up and had their own way, and they made the most of it. That swindling Pumblechook, exalted into the beneficent contriver of the whole occasion, actually took the top of the table, and, when he addressed them on the subject of my being bound, and had fiendishly congratulated them on my being liable to imprisonment if I played at cards, drank strong liquors, kept late hours or bad company, or indulged in other vagaries which the form of my indentures appeared to contemplate as next to inevitable, he placed me standing on a chair beside him to illustrate his remarks. My only other remembrances of the great festival are that they wouldn't let me go to sleep, but whenever they saw me dropping off, woke me up and told me to enjoy myself. That, rather late in the evening, Mr. Wopsle gave us Collins' ode, and threw his blood-stained sword in thunder down, with such effect that a waiter came in and said, The commercials underneath sent up their compliments, and it wasn't the tumbler's arms. That, when they were all in excellent spirits on the road home, and sang, O oh, Lady Fair, Mr. Wopsle taking the bass, and asserting with a tremendously strong voice, in reply to the inquisitive boar who leads that piece of music in a most impertinent manner, by wanting to know all about everybody's private affairs, that he was the man with his white locks flowing, and that he was upon the whole the weakest pilgrim going. Finally, I remember that when I got into my little bedroom, I was truly wretched, and had a strong conviction on me that I should never like Joe's trade. I had liked it once, but once was not now. End of chapter.